Okay, so we're going to talk now about um, the second part of regional analgesia, which is when we inject medication, usually local anesthetic, into a synovial structure. So either into a joint or less commonly into a tendon sheath. So both those structures are lined by a synovial membrane. So when we talk about intrasynovial blocks, we're talking about medication being injected into one of these two structures, either into an herb block, sorry, either into a joint or into a, snow, into a sheath. And the main thing here is that the hyaline cartilage and the tissue that makes up um, joint surfaces and the structures inside a tendon sheath have very limited ability to deal with infection. So we want to be very careful about performing this procedure in as aseptic a manner as possible to reduce the risk of our patient developing a, an infection after the procedure. The risk is low, but it's important that we take um, all the efforts or take all the precautions we can to avoid running into problems. So this is a picture here of a horse receiving um, an intrasynovial injection into the metacarpophalangeal joint or into the fatlock joint. So you can see that the area has been clipped up. The person doing the injecting is wearing sterile gloves. This is a new needle and syringe and the medication they're injecting is from a vial that's just been opened. And you can see the person holding the horse's limb is doing so with their hands carefully away from the injection site. So all the steps you can take to reduce contamination of the site are being, are being observed. Okay, so we mentioned earlier um, about the importance of full skin preparation when we were doing this and the fact that we'll generally clip. We're also going to ensure that all the medication we use is new and likewise all the equipment is going to be sterile and we're going to make sure that while we're handling the equipment and carrying out the procedure, we're being careful not to contaminate anything. What we don't want to do is introduce any bacteria from the environment or the skin or hair coat into the normal, normally sterile tissues inside the joint or the tendon sheath. Um, we mentioned clipping and the fact that it is normally um, carried out for intrasynovial um, anesthesia or analgesia. We mentioned the importance of confirming permission to clip with the client um, before you do so and making sure confirming the precise location and position to hold the limb in while you're clipping with the vet. Okay, I'm not going to go over that again. But the other thing to bear in mind is that most horses don't like being clipped, but some really hate it and can become quite violent. So while it's tempting to kind of try and restrain them and allow us to go ahead and clip them, this can end up getting into a row quite quickly. And, you know, fighting with horses is counterproductive. They're bigger and stronger than we are. And we risk, you know, making them resent humans or resent being handled, which is not ideal as well. So a better way to do it is to use negative reinforcement um, to con condition the horse to stand quietly and accept being clipped because it's not a painful procedure, it's just they don't like the vibration or the sound in some cases. So negative reinforcement is when the horse relaxes, the source of irritation, which is the clippers, goes away. And that's a much safer way to retrain the horse to allow you to clip it without getting into, into a row with it. So the British Equine Veterinary Association, or BIVA, have a video series called Don't Break Your Vet on YouTube. And that video series talks you through equine learning theory and how to use it to safely retrain horses to allow you to perform procedures like this. And they have one on clipping. So I'd recommend that you look at that. If you click it here, um, it'll play the video and it, it's only seven minutes long. It will allow you to view the horse and so today and about the problem to Gemma, what are we going to learn about so today malcolm we're going to look at horses that are okay so that's a video that you can use to just remind yourself how to allow the horse to be clipped without having a, a row with them okay the example i'm going to use for an intrasynovial injection is the carpal joint so that's the joint in the forelimb and um, between the distal radius and the proximal metacarpus it's a common joint for inflammation or as a source of lameness. So it's also one we'll routinely block in practice. It's straightforward to do because when the limb is flexed, the dorsal aspect of the joint opens up, creating a nice wide area to insert needles in. So if we have a look at a flex radiograph of the carpus, so you see if we go back to the weight bearing one, you can see how the joint spaces are quite narrow. When we pick up the limb and flex it, you can see that we're creating these openings between the distal radius and the proximal row of carpal bones. So that's the radiocarpal joint. And then we have a second opening between the um, proximal and distal row of carpal bones, 
within the joint itself. The joint between the distal row of carpal bones and the metacarpophalangeal um, or the, uh, the metacarpus is normally very low mobile, but it's not one we need to inject either. It's not associated with lameness. Most of the problems we see are associated with the proximal and intracarpal joints. You can actually see on this radiograph here, this horse's little bony spur um, on the edge of the um, proximal row of carpal bones. So the arrow there is indicating the location in which you're going to pass your needle. So you're going to um, clip the hair and scrub the skin over this injection site. Then you're going to slide your needle through the skin, through the subcutaneous tissue, through the um, capsule of the, the radial carpal joint and through the synovial membrane into the synovial fluid. And then you can inject your local anesthetic in there. You leave it for five minutes or so for the local anesthetic to work. And then if there's pain associated with that joint, the animal will become more comfortable once the block has taken effect. If we want to inject the intracarpal joint, it's the same thing. We're just putting our needle in at a slightly different angle into that space between the proximal and distal row of carpal bones. And this is a picture of somebody doing it. So again, you can see the, the hair patch has been clipped. We mentioned all right the importance of clipping the limb in this position. You can foresee if that horse was weight bearing when you clipped the hair over the carpal joint, then when you go to flex the limb, all of a sudden your clip patch of hair is up here over the distal radius and we're no longer able to inject through the, the clipped area. So clip the limb in whatever position the vet wants to have it in when they give the medication. You can see as well the person is um, wearing sterile gloves and they're using a new needle and syringe. In this case, they appear to be medicating the joint with um, medication, whereas if it's local anesthetic, it's normally clear in color and you'd be using a larger volume. That's the basic principle. And um, we've covered aseptic skin preparation in earlier lectures. So go back and revise that from your surgical nursing if you need to, or from clinical pathology last year. Um, but again, we're talking about at least five minute contact time in most cases. You're using either chlorhexidine or povolanoidine scrub solutions. You're rinsing the detergent away from the area with either isopropyl alcohol or sterile saline before you then um, leave the site ready to be injected and being careful at all times not to recontaminate the site afterwards. Okay, so that's a quick chat through the procedure for a carpal joint. The principle is the same for other joints in the body. Um, again, you can find a description for the anatomical approach for each joint within um, textbooks like equine joint injections by Jim Schumacher, or you can ask your clinician, please show me what position you want the joint to be in, where are you going to place the needle, what area do you need me to clip and scrub up, and that way you can avoid problems where you've inadvertently prepped the wrong area. I'm going to just run through then briefly some other joints that you might find yourself um, blocking or medicating. The coffin joint is the distal intraphalangeal joint. It's the joint here between the middle and distal phalanges in the digit. Um, most of the joint is enclosed within the hoof wall, which we can't inject through, but there is a dorsal pouch um, which is protrudes up beyond the coronary band, and that's normally the easiest place to get a needle into the joint. So you can see here uh, needle site A is injecting into the dorsal pouch. You can also put the needle down at an angle at site B here um, under the coronary band into the joint, or you can um, inject from the palmar or plantar aspect into the um, DIP or distal intraphalangeal joint. This one, I think, in my experience, is least routinely used because you can see here. There's other structures in here we could inadvertently damage, such as the deep digital flexor tendon or the navicular bursa. Whereas if we go in through the dorsal approach or the lateral approach, there's less structures in the way. And to give you an idea of where to, to clip and prep, this picture on the left is a view of the front feet of a horse and the purple lines indicate the extensor tendons. And you can either place your needle through the extensor tendon or just to one side of it. So the picture on the right shows a needle placed through the coronary band and the extensor tendon down into the um, distal interphalangeal joint. So again, it's a question of sitting down with your vet and figuring out where you want to prep and what direction of needle placement they want to use and preparing the site from there. So you can see in this image, the hair has been clipped off the whole distal limb. Um, normally we won't be that extensive. We just remove a patch um, over the area where we want to inject the needle. That shows you the 
end of the extensor tendon and then you can also place your needle through um, a site just lateral medial to it so those red um, dots indicate either an approach through the extensor tendon or to one side of it um, it's up to the vet which one they use so as i say check with them how you go about it and the other place we can do a coffin joint block is uh, in an approach that's parallel to the ground. I haven't seen this one used as widely, but it is very straightforward. It's avoiding pushing the needle tip in between the second and third phalanges. So I feel it reduces the risk of needle breakage. Um, so that's personally the approach I prefer to use in practice. But again, that it's personal preference. So do ask your colleagues in practice what approach they use and how they want you to help them prepare for that. As I say, this second arrow indicates the more traditional approach, which I feel personally increases the risk of needle breakage. Moving up then the limb, the next joint you might want to block is the pastern joint. This joint has quite a small joint space and it's tricky enough to get a needle into it. That said, it's not a joint we, we routinely block. We don't see a huge amount of injury or pain associated with the pastern joint. If we do want to block out this region, we have the option of a um, of axial sesamoid block, which will achieve the same result. So in my experience in practice, the pastern joint is rarely blocked. If you are going to use it, there's a lateral approach we tend to use um, through the, the side of the pastern. Fetlock joint block, really, really common. You can see I've marked an asterisk in the, in the presentation here. This is placing a needle into the metacarpophalangeal or metatarsophalangeal joint space. It's very straightforward to do. When we flex the limb, we can open up the fetlock joint and allow us to place a needle in there easy, easily. Three different approaches are described. Um, you can go in from laterally, you can come in from the front or the dorsal approach, or you can place a needle on the palmar aspect of the joint into the um, palmar pouch, kind of between the end of the third metacarpal bone and the proximal sesamoid. So it's up to, again, it's up to your vet which approach they use and whether they want the limb to be flexed or the horse to be weight bearing when they place the needle. So again, just check with them how they want you to set up for the procedure. Um, personally, when I'm doing it, I tend to use the, um, this approach here, the third one, which is into the, the dorsal space. Pretty straightforward. You can see this photograph on the left. This horse has actually extra fluid in its fetlock joint. It's a fuse and you can see these little tell telltale kind of bumps of extra fluid under the skin indicating that the fetlock joint is distended. There are sometimes called wind galls and this image here we saw earlier it shows someone using the, the lateral approach. So again it, it depends on the, the preference of the person you're working with. We've mentioned the carpus already. Moving further up the limb we can very occasionally block the elbow or the shoulder joint. It's not routinely done but it is technically possible if you need be. The elbow is pretty straightforward. So the lower picture here on the right shows someone that, that the tip of that person's thumb is in the joint space of the elbow. And you can actually feel that if you run your finger in there, you can feel the joint space between the olecranon and the end of the humerus. So it's pretty straightforward. The shoulder joint, um, this person's picture, um, hand in the top picture, their thumbs mark in the lateral edge of the head of the humerus and their fingertips are in the um, shoulder joint space. It's quite a big joint, it's quite deep, so it usually needs a spinal needle. So this picture here is of a four inch spinal needle, which you can use to inject local anesthetic into the shoulder joint if you need to do it. But it's not one you routinely do. If you find yourself doing one, often you'll have to go and look up exactly what approach to use, and that's fine. Uh, hind limb joint blocks. So in the distal limb, if we're blocking the distal interphalangeal joint or the pastern joint or the fetlock joint is exactly the same as I've just described in the forelimb, which is great. That leaves us with the tarsus, the stifle and the hip, um, all of which can be blocked, but again, aren't that commonly done. If we start at the stifle, um, first of all, remember this is the joint with two um, sections to it. We have the femoral patellar part of the stifle joint on the cranial edge of the distal femur. And then we have the femorotibial joint between the uh, condyles on the distal femur and the proximal tibia. So depending on what part of the joint we want to anesthetize, our needle approach is going to be different depending on where we're trying to end up. So if we want to block the femorotibial joint, first of all, we can palpate um, the joint space here between the distal end of the, the tibia, sorry, the proximal end of the tibia and the distal end of the femoral condyle. So this person's fingertip is sitting into the femoral tibial joint space. 
just caudal to the um, patellar ligament. You can also um, approach this joint medially. So this is the one I tended to use in practice. You can basically, if you were going to inject the right femorotibial joint in this case, you'd stand on the left-hand side of the horse and you're reaching across under the animal and you're putting your needle in there and injecting your local anesthetic. Um, you've got to be careful where you put your head. Obviously, you don't want to put your head right in as you stick in the needle and get kicked in the face. But once you're conscious of that, you can keep your head out of the way as you're actually placing the needle. In fairness to most horses, they tolerate it well, but you just want to be, to be careful. So you can see here, this is doing it from the same side, and I find this technically trickier. And this is injecting the left femorotibial joint from the left side of the horse. Um, you can't really see what you're doing. Whereas if you go back here and you inject the right femorotibial joint from the left side of the horse, I personally find this easier because you can see if you're clipping or preparing this site or doing the injection, just be careful you don't tickle the horse's flank or abdomen with your hair. That can irritate them more sometimes than, than the needle. So just be conscious of that. Try not to tickle them while you're working under their, their flanks or abdomen. Um, to block the tarsus, we can do this quite routinely. The tibiotarsal joint, first of all, is the largest compartment of the tarsus. It's, it's between the trochlear ridges and the distal tibia. And that's pretty straightforward to do. Whereas if we go further down the tarsus, we have these small intertarsal joints, um, which are smaller and trickier. So for example, if you want to inject a needle into those little narrow joint spaces, that red dot indicates where we want to place it. Or we can go into the um, joint between the distal tarsal bone and the metatarsus, third metatarsus. And you can see how narrow that joint space is on the x-ray, it's, it's barely visible, so we're using very small needles. Um, in terms of some landmarks, this is a little bit of um, joint effusion or extrasynovial fluid in the tibiotarsal joint, so we're getting a little pocket of swelling here between the um, underneath the calcanean tendon or Achilles tendon and caudal to the, um, the talus, so it's basically swelling in here. If we want to inject between the distal rotarsal bones and the top of the um, third metatarsal bone, the site is over the head of the fourth metatarsal bone or, or splint bone. So again, ask your vet exactly where they want you to clip and scrub up for this. Once you know what you're looking for, you can palpate these joint spaces, but they are quite small. If you're not used to doing it, just ask your, your colleague to show you where they want to do it. Um, if you're using the medial approach into the tibiotarsal joint, just be careful. There's a very large blood vessel, um, the saphenous vein, running over the medial side of the joint. And just obviously don't stick your needle in that big blood vessel. You can tell it's a blood vessel. You can feel it underneath the skin. Um, but if you do prang it, you tend to get um, a fairly big hematoma fairly quickly, which is obviously not ideal. Uh, this person is demonstrating here the site to inject um, between the medial um, head of the splint bone, so the second metatarsal bone and the distal um, tarsal bones between on the medial side of the hock. So again, you can see if you're injecting this, it may be easier to work from the opposite side of the horse. So you can see where you're placing the needle. So there you go. That's into the, the top dot is into the tibiotarsal joint. The bottom dot is into the lower tarsal joint. Again, just be careful to put um, your prep site exactly where the vet wants to place the needle. And there's a few other things we can put local anesthetic into. Um, I'm not going to mention the hip joint. Sorry, just to go back to that for a second. It is possible to inject the hip joint, but you need a very, very long needle, um, an 8 to 12 inch needle. So it's quite a specialised um, procedure to do. I have seen it done once or twice in practice, but it's not routine. We don't see much hip disease in horses. Um, so it's technically possible, but not something you'll routinely find yourself doing. Whereas stifle and hock, more straightforward. Okay, um, in terms of intrasynovial, we mentioned that most times we're injected into a joint, but we are sometimes going into other structures. And the two main ones are the navicular bursa or the tendon sheath. So the navicular bursa, first of all, is a little um, outpouching between the deep, deep digital flexor tendon and the um, distal sesamoid bone on the palmar or plantar surface of the hoof. So if you want to inject it, we've got to slide our needle in here parallel to the ground. We've got to sneak in over the um, hoof wall and over the top of the 
distal um, sesamoid bone through the deep digital flexor tendon into the navicular bursa. So it's quite a small structure that we're aiming for. Um, this is something that we'll often check the needle placement using radiography before we inject any medication through our needle just to make sure we have it in the right space because it's, it's quite a small site that we're aiming for and you can't really tell by feel when you're in the navicular bursa. A um, couple of different approaches described. A is the one I've seen most commonly used in practice. You're driving the needle um, parallel to the ground through the heel bulbs. There's also a slightly more um, dorsal or um, proximal approach described, which is shown by B here in this diagram. But either way, we want to end up with the tip of the needle tucked in between the deep digital flexor tendon and the navicular bone to allow us to deposit our local anesthetic into the navicular bursa. Um, as I said, it's something that we'll routinely do um, with radiography to confirm correct needle placement. So this is showing you the photograph on the bottom is showing a horse in the x-ray room with a needle that's been placed through the heel bulbs um, using the more dorsal approach or more proximal approach into the navicular bursa. And then you can see the syringe is loaded up, but before we inject it, we want to take a radiograph to make sure that our um, local anesthetic is going to end up in the right place. So this is a picture on the left, it's an x-ray confirming correct needle placement. So you can see the needle tip has is tucked up there against the, the back of the navicular bone. And then the second image on the right is showing um, this radio opaque uh, medication con contained within the navicular bursa. So we know the needle placement was correct. So you may find yourself doing this procedure in the x-ray room and been asked to take a lateral foot and radiograph after the needle has been placed. So just something to, to plan for when you're setting up for this procedure. And the tendon sheet then, sorry, little images over the right one. The tendon sheet is a structure that protects the flexor tendons as you run over the back of the metacarpophalangeal joint or metatarsophalangeal joint. So this is this picture here. Um, this is a horse whose right hind limb has been has been clipped up. And you can see the two red lines indicate the proximal and distal extent of the tendon sheet. So it starts um, usually about an inch proximal to the fetlock joint over the distal one third of the metatarsal bone in this case. And it runs down surrounding the um, tendons until about the level of the, the distal pastern. So it's usually this structure is about four or five inches long on average. It's very, very thin, delicate structure. The normal horse just contains a tiny amount of synovial fluid that helps to lubricate and protect the tendons as they run over the back of the fetlock joint. If you imagine when the horse is galloping, this part of the body undergoes a lot of flexion and extension. So this structure helps to kind of cushion the tendons as they run over um, the proximal sesamoid bones. However, if this sheet gets inflamed or infected, it can fill up with extra fluid and it becomes really... Um, prominent. So again, this is um, the same view of the hind limbs of a horse. The right hind limb, we're seeing a normal um, tendon sheet. It's barely visible. However, the left hind bone, the tendon sheet, is grossly distended with fluid. And you can see this swelling is characteristically running from the distal end of the metatarsis down about half to two thirds of the way down the pastern on the plantar surface of the limb. When you see that, it's fairly pathonomic for the synovial um, sheath involvement. There's not, no other structure there that has these anatomical margins. Now, if the horse is fully weight-bearing, it's probably just inflamed. It might be due to um, overuse or an injury. Whereas if the animal has this swelling and is also lame, if it's three out of five or four out of five or five out of five lame, that's an emergency. It's telling us that the inflammation in this structure is severe enough to cause the horse pain and lameness and we want to get in there and treat it as soon as possible. So very important, don't ignore a horse with swelling in this part of the limb that also happens to be lame. Yeah, you have a very short window opportunity to try and treat them. If we want to put a needle into the tendon sheath, we've a couple of different approaches. A is the proximal approach, which is just over the proximal end of the um, sesamoid bones on the midline on the back of the limb. And then B is the distal approach, just at the back of the pastern over the um, heel bulbs. Again, it depends on your clinician's preference. I personally prefer to use the, the approach shown at A here, but either will work. So again, ask your clinician, where do you want me to clip up? How are you going to position the limb while we, while we do this procedure? 
Okay, so that's a quick run through intrasynovial um, anesthesia, mostly into joints, which is most common, but sometimes into the tendon sheath or the navicular bursus. So there's two other structures to be aware of. Let's move this back up here. Um, normally I'd ask you for questions at this point in class, but at this stage, if you have any, please post them on the forum thread so that I can see them and respond to them along with the rest of the class. Okay. Right, we're going to carry on and talk about lame horses. The next lecture I'm going to share with you is going to be looking at what happens when we've completed our lameness evaluation, we've trotted the horse, we've flexed it, we've carried out um, our nerve blocks, or we've done some intrasynovial anesthesia or a combination of the two, and we figured out, okay, we now know the pain in this horse is coming from, say, the left fore um, heel, or it's coming from the distal carpal um, joint, or it's coming from the cannon bone, or whatever the case might be. We've narrowed the source of the pain down using our clinical examination, our lameness evaluation, and our regional anesthesia. And the next step is going to be doing more diagnostic tests to try and figure out exactly what is wrong with structures in the painful area. So that's what we'll address in the next lecture. Okay, thanks very much.